have a better panel um, to address this important topic. We'll be starting today with Tom Shrout, um, who is a partner at uh, Avant Partners. Um, we will then uh, hear from Morgan Lyons, uh, followed by Jared Barner and Gloria Owen. Um, and we have a terrific panel provided for you today. Um, Morgan is the Assistant Vice President for Communications and Community Engagement at the Dallas Area Rapid Transit uh, System. And so we'll have both the consultant perspective and the agency perspective, as well as the advocate perspective from Gloria Oland, who's the Policy and Communications Director at Move LA, um, and Jared Varner, again, the Executive Director for Rock Metro, uh, Rock Region Metro. Today, if you have questions, just go ahead and type those into the, um, the little uh, window on the right side of your screen, and we will be answering questions at the end of the, at the, end of the uh, webinar. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Tom Shrout. Thank you, Barney. Um, It's good to be with you. Um, uh, I'm only a consultant later in life. Uh, I spent 22 years as a leading an advocacy organization here in St. Louis. And during that time, I've had an opportunity to see what our opponents do in their strategies. And uh, it's best that you start thinking about this kind of thing happening now because if you get into a, some kind of tax measure, no doubt these critics are going to show up in your doorstep and it's best to be uh, ready for them. So who are these people? Well, there's a guy by the name of Wendell Cox. Uh, Wendell grew up in Portland, Oregon, uh, went to, became a libertarian at some point along the way, uh, ended up on the Metro board at in Los Angeles uh, as a critic of transit, believe it or not, and has used that kind of association with transit to say that he's an authority about how transit systems ought to be expanded and utilized. There's another one by the name of Randall O'Toole. Randall lives in rural Oregon and has somehow linked up with some of the libertarian organizations and has kind of created a cottage industry of writing about all the faults of transit and why it doesn't make sense to invest in transit. And then you have some not-for-profit so-called think tank institutions, the Cato Institute, the Reason Foundation, and the Heritage Foundation. All these have connections to the uh, libertarian movement in this country and are basically anti-tax uh, organizations and have not seen a transit project that they like. And with some of the growth and power of these organizations, not only are there national organizations these days, but sometimes there are state-centric uh, libertarian organizations who are also anti-tax. Then, then there's the Tea Party, which we've all followed. Uh, the Tea Party on its own, I don't view much as a threat. I mean, it's the same 40% of the people that won't vote for any tax are not going to vote for your uh, transit tax. Um, but to the degree they can be organized by some of the other national organizations, they pose a threat, in my opinion, in that way. And more recently, there's the Americans for Prosperity, uh, a, DC-based uh, activist group, again, funded by the same people, the Koch brothers, who uh, are against taxes, but who are taking um, more advanced measures than what Wendell Cox and Randall O'Toole used to do. And we're going to hear from uh, Little Rock in a bit, where the Americans for Prosperity were active in a recent transit tax measure. Again, these groups are often funded by Cato or Reason or the Koch brothers. Um, the way Cox and O'Toole operated, and I'm not seeing as much of them recently as I did maybe five years ago, 
Well, what sometimes they have a local sponsor that brings them in. Sometimes they bring come in and announced, unannounced. Uh, they will bring a thick report with them where they've analyzed your project and concluded surprisingly that it's a waste of money. Uh, usually they um, focused on rail, but we're seeing some changes in that strategy. Uh, they usually say that rail is too expensive and what a region ought to do is invest in buses, bus rapid transit, it's so less, more or less expensive than rail. Uh, but again, we're seeing a change in that. And they have a number of quotable lines, um, including that, you know, for the cost of this project, every carless person in, in your region could be, it used to be at BMW more recently to be more environmentally friendly, so-called. Uh, it's been a Toyota Prius. You could buy everyone a Toyota Prius um, for the same amount of money we're spending on this rail project. Now, they, they failed to go on to say, well, what happens when that Prius wears out? Are we going to buy them another one? Or what about the handicapped person uh, who cannot drive? You know, how about that person? How about the person that's underage to drive? They don't, they fail to uh, talk about those particulars. And then the most recent thing that I've seen come out of O'Toole is self-driving cars will make transit unnecessary. Uh, Todd Littman has written about this argument. Uh, if you want to get into lots of details, the Victoria Transit uh, Transportation Institute. Todd is a is one of the leading thinkers on the pro transit side, but um, it, it gets down to space, you know, uh, with self driving cars. Well, you know, uh, in St. Louis, we draw three million fans a year to Cardinal baseball. Now, how are we going to get everybody in a self driving car to the stadium within a 30 minute time period? You know, the space issue just simply doesn't make sense. Plus the cost issue. Americans for Prosperity are kind of a new entry uh, into the anti-transit uh, folks. They have a higher level of funding than Cox and O'Toole do, and they often get involved in a project before it is even a viable project. And the excellent, excellent example, in my opinion, is Nashville, where Nashville uh, considered a light rail line for a number of years and the uh, anti-track tax crowd was against light rail, you ought to be investing in buses. And so not necessarily because of the anti-rail argument, but because the officials and the planners in Nashville concluded that um, a bus rapid transit system would make more sense for Nashville. Well, what happens? All of a sudden, Americans for Prosperity gets involved in the state capitol in the legislative process well before something is to go to the ballot and argues to the legislature that uh, BRT should not be allowed on any state roads. Well, guess where the BRT was supposed to go? On a state road. So they're getting more sophisticated, they're getting Americans for Prosperity is getting involved earlier. Uh, one of their tactics, for instance, in Phoenix was to do a lot of YouTube uh, faux newscast where they would interview some so-called expert who would give all the reasons why, why expanding light rail in Phoenix was not a good idea. They would not explicitly say vote no on a particular tax measure, thus kind of stay in the, in the advocacy role as opposed to um, the education role, excuse me, as opposed to the advocacy role, which means as long as they're educating, quote, educating, uh, they don't need to report um, sources of their revenue and how it's expended with the um, uh, ethics commission or whatever it is that keeps track of campaign funding. Um, Indianapolis is coming up with a referendum in November and already Americans for Prosperity has been active in Indianapolis. 
So what can you do? Well, one of the things I think that's important is to what I call inoculate the media. So you have someone come to town with a report that says, you know, this project doesn't make sense because of this, that, and the other. I think it's important that you talk to your media well ahead of time and say, you know, this group is coming, here's who funds them, here's their point of view, and make sure that you include that when you write a story about their press conference, that these are libertarians, they're funded from out-of-state interests, and they don't have um, the best interests of your local community in mind. Uh, it's also important that you have uh, your, your coalition should be in place well before any of this becomes about so that your word of mouth, your social media, and so on are ramped up and keeping their uh, followers informed about the misinformation that's about to be um, thrust onto the community. You need to be prepared for talk radio. Normally what they do is there's usually an AM station in your community that carries Rush Limbaugh and other anti-tax uh, groups, and they will try to get onto that station. So that when it's usually a call-in program, and make sure that your uh, members of your coalition and people are ready to call in that day and hammer them and talk about, uh, get them off message about why are out-of-towners coming into my community to tell us how to vote on a project. Uh, you need to refute their claims, but be careful. This is a fine line. Don't get uh, drawn in to talk about their assertions. You need to get on message and stay on message, message and why this is a great investment for our community and what it means for us. And these out-of-towners shouldn't be in telling us what to do. So I'm going to give you a little assignment. Um, you need to do your homework. Uh, go out and Google Wendell Cox, Randall O'Toole, Reason Foundation, Cato Institute, Americans for Prosperity. Just as an aside, Americans for Prosperity not only are against transit measures, but get this, they, came, they went to Columbus, Ohio a couple of years ago and came out against the tax measure uh, for the local zoo. So they're against kids too. Um, you need to engage with CFTE, and local advocates have been through it, and look forward to hearing about Little Rock. Um, it's important that all of us talk about our experiences and what we did that didn't work and share that with fellow transit advocates across the country. You need to be prepared, so write a plan. What happens when Wendell Cox shows up in my community? What happens? when Americans for Prosperity show up in my community and we're hoping to pass a transit measure. You need to have a plan written and in place and practiced and shared with your champions, your coalition members, and other supporters so that they're ready to go. And again, one more time, you need to inoculate the media. So that's kind of an overview of the critics and who they are and what they're doing. and I look forward to hearing from the other panelists. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, we will um, switch our present presenters for a moment. And uh, while we're doing that, I just want to echo um, Tom's uh, call to you to educate yourself about who the opponents um, to transit are I think one of the, the best defenses is um, knowing knowing where your uh, knowing where your critics are coming from, um, and educating yourself about some of the common messages that have popped up elsewhere. Um, and it looks like Morgan is ready to go with his presentation, so I will turn it on over to him now. Uh, thanks, Marty. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, you know the the title of the uh, presentation is a little bit of uh, absurd because if you've done any of this for oh I don't know longer than a couple of days, we all know that 
that a lot of the uh, the criticisms we get, and, and Tom mentioned a couple of the, the folks who've been down to visit us on more than one occasion, uh, can be absurd. Uh, so I, I guess my general approach is, you know, life is short. Laugh first, and um, and then let's get to uh, let's get to work. You know, you're going to hear all kinds of wild things about why people shouldn't support uh, investment in transit. Uh, they they come up with all kinds of reasons, uh, and I think Tom covered a lot of those about sprawl and driving and cheaper to buy everyone a, a BMW. But but here are some of the things that I really want you guys to walk out uh, with today. Uh, first of all, you've got to use a consistent message. Uh, everybody needs to be on the uh, fr working out of the same out of the same page. Uh, fight from good ground. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, protect your home, your home base, your home messages, and and grow that that home base. And then finally. Stay focused on the end game. Um, these campaigns typically happen over several weeks or several months or in some cases well over a year as you begin talking about what you'd like to see happen in your community. And, and a lot of the critics will start popping up. They'll start coming to community meetings or board meetings or whatever. And so you just need to stay focused on the uh, end game. And that's really, that's really going to kind of flow from the, the message. Now let me spend just a moment kind of building on, on what Tom was talking about uh, with the critics and basically people, you know, who doesn't love transit? It, it's kind of hard for some of us on this call to understand, but he identified a variety of specific groups, but I think you generally see where uh, these folks fall. You know, they're pro-sprawl, anti-government, anti-tax, or they may just be some specific issue. They may just not like your organization or the, uh, the leadership. So. They're always going to be with us. They're always going to be in our communities. Uh, there's not a lot we can do about them except try to, to manage them and uh, isolate them and grow our own group of, of advocates. So what I want to talk about for the next few minutes is not so much about persuading them, because you really can't. Let's talk about dealing with them, and let's talk about gaining ground with the people you can support. And it all starts with the message. Think about just uh, for a minute. Why do you believe in investing in public transportation? What's the value in in your community? Uh, if I think if we did a uh, a little snap poll among the uh, the folks who were on the call, it would range from you know it's a public good. I want to help my community. It's economic development. I think we need to help people who can't afford alternatives. There, there are any number of reasons. Smart growth, all of those, all of those different things. Interest groups form around those core individual uh, topics, and and your message, the message you need to to develop your campaign or your your program around, really begins to to be a a consolidation or you're forming a coalition among those individual groups. You find uh, more things that, that are like or that you, you have in common rather than the things that, uh, that you have kind of separate. Uh, you know, I mentioned uh, a list on here on the slide where public transportation goes, community grows, and that's the APTA branding message. And, and having been involved with that from the, from the beginning, you know, our, our goal was to find a, a values-based message. Uh, numbers get you in all kinds of trouble. They're important. But if you appeal to that higher value of how public transportation can transform your community, I, I think you're, you're often in a, a much stronger uh, place than linking X dollars uh, to produce Y growth in ridership and Z results. All of those things are, are important, but think about how you can build a message from that higher value of the benefit to your, uh, your community. You know, think in terms of things of, you know, because I want my community to be better, to be healthier, I support transit. Transit really becomes a means to an end. It's not just we need more of it. But what's the end game? What's the objective? 
I want to think at a, at a higher level, work at a higher level, focus on the broad theme, and then you work through the, the specifics. Transit opponents do the same thing. You know, they're opposed to, uh, to big government or really any kind of government. Uh, local transit agencies are often a part of that, and so they don't, they don't support it. Um, I think Tom gave an excellent example when you, when you look at, at some of the groups that are out there. One week they're opposed to transit, and the next week they are uh, opposed to a zoo. Uh, go figure. So I think, uh, but everyone within their constituency can articulate their core message. And I think we as transit advocates are stronger when we're able to identify a core message and be able to uh, articulate that successfully. A little bit of a side note here, and, and I have uh, Aristotle, for those of you who don't automatically recognize him. Critics of transit uh, like big visual arguments. The BMW or Prius example is a good one. Uh, people vote with their gas pedals or, or any of that kind of stuff. Facts can kind of go all, uh, all over the place. Uh, but facts can also be your friends. And logic can help, too. And this is where you kind of wind up with, with Aristotle. Uh, and actually, you get to use him helping you defend transit. You know, think through this argument for a second. You know, zombies move around in groups. Public transportation involves groups or people traveling in groups. Therefore, public transit customers are zombies. Now, that's ridiculous, uh, although, it, you know, as you see on the slide, we have some people riding the, the, uh, the train out of, in D.C. going on the, the Vienna line. But it's that simple, silly notion that it is cheaper to give everyone a BMW or it is, it is uh, cheaper to, uh, to do something other than invest in, uh, invest in transit. You know, if you remember your Latin, it's reductio ad absurdum, reduction to the absurd. Just don't get sucked into it. That's why, that's why you need to have that, that stronger message. You know, when somebody says something utterly outrageous, and they will, you know, it's, it's I think, totally appropriate to say something along the lines of, that's just silly. You know, this is about improving the quality of life in our community. And we think that this program, this expansion, or this new line, or this whatever, is is the best way to do that. And we've already seen how this works in our community. I mean, call silly arguments for what what they are. Next, choose good ground. Now, if you've ever watched any war movie, you know you know, you get a general idea about that. And really what I mean here is, is know your strongest issues. Again, as you, as you look at the coalition that makes up your organization, what are the voting issues? What are the things that will get people to the polls? When you look at transit supporters, as we've done over the last couple of years with, uh, with a lot of the APTA work, you know, we find that the economic impact arguments continue to be the strongest. And they're most consistently strong. But there's support for other issues. Environmental issues are, are, are one of them. Very power, powerful arguments, but with a, a very defined and not all that big of a group. Now, the folks who absolutely believe in that, absolutely believe in that, and you need to engage them. But look at how you can begin to organize that winning coalition from your strongest issues. You need to know your biggest supporters. And that can be from the business community, that can be just from community organizations, uh, labor groups, any number of, of organizations. You need to know those folks. You also need to know your opponents. And you need to know how people communicate. Let me go back to the supporter argument and knowing your biggest supporters. If you've been involved in campaigns for any length of time and have done any work in opposition research, you know, one of the things you're going to spend your most, most of your time on really at the beginning is understanding your weaknesses. Know what those are. If you don't find them, the other guys are going to, and you've got to know those quickly. You also need to know how people choose to communicate. 
Uh, just because there are about 8 billion different social media channels out there doesn't mean you need to be on all of them. Pick the ones that are strongest for your constituency. Pick the ones where you find folks. You may find a very active Twitter group. Use that one. You may find a, a Facebook group. Use that one. Maybe it's a little both. Maybe it's direct mail. Maybe it's email. But find the right channels for your group. Next, protect your home and grow it. Recruit advocates constantly. Never stop recruiting new advocates. You gain new supporters, you gain some fresh perspective, and you can demonstrate support. You really can't have enough strong advocates. You've got to keep growing that group. Finally, stay focused on the end game. It goes really back to the, to the first question I ask. Why do you believe in transit? What's the core message for your organization? And when it gets difficult, remember it's business, it's not personal. And then think about what you want and how you're going to get it. And that really comes down to understanding your core message. You know, public transportation doesn't rise to the top of, of really anyone's uh, list of issues except ours. Uh, when you start to, to list all of the things that people are worried about in the world, for our purposes, unfortunately, public transportation doesn't come up to the top of the list. Although we touch all those, so many of those things, don't we? When we're talking about uh, economic development and jobs and stimulating the local economy and, and raising a quality of life, how can you plug into that? How can you support those types of initiatives? Let me wrap up this way as you think about responding to critics. Messages matter. Have a strong core message. You can unite around that core message. Pick your battles. It goes back to the finding the good ground. And pick the place. You know, where do you need to have your arguments? Where do you need to communicate with your supporters? What's the best way and the best places? What are the best places to attack your critics? Friends are good. Get more of them. And finally, know why you do all of this. Uh, this can be difficult work. It's also important work, and it's emotional work. Uh, and it's a good thing that uh, there are folks who are willing to fight the good fight and do everything they can to improve the quality of life in our regions. Look forward to questions as we go through this. Thanks very much for the opportunity. Terrific. Thank you so much, Morgan. While we get our third presenter loaded up, I think uh, one of the things that, that you said re that resonated with me is you can never have too many advocates. And I think that is just so true. If you are um, you know, not out there beating the bushes for new folks that you can bring to the table and making that tent bigger, um, it's, you're really missing an opportunity to broaden the base of support for public transit. So. Um, it looks like we are all set and Jordan is ready, so um, I will turn that over to him. Well, thank you very much. This is uh, Jared Varner with Rock Region Metro here in, in central Arkansas. Um, we recently went through the process of um, going to the voters and, and asking for dedicated funding for transit, which we, we lack in our area. Um, unfortunately, on March 1st, um, we came up short. We received 43% of the vote, um, which again, I, I, I took pretty, um, it was a hard hit for me, but talking to folks who have been here longer, I've only been here about two and a half years, they felt that uh, it was really a strong foundation and a strong base to build upon. Um, but we really started, our whole process started about um, almost two years ago. Uh, we went through an 18 month planning process called Move Central Arkansas. And really the, the plan there was to develop this vision for transit in Central Arkansas and to not only use that plan to take to the voters, but to really benefit from the process. Uh, it was a very inclusive process, very transparent, and uh, involved a lot of people in the community. So the thought process was, well, let's, let's engage the community and stakeholders in developing this plan, uh, and that'll make the community more likely to, to support it uh, at the end of the day. Um, and so we, we went through that process, and we found that um, we had a really good set of services that we wanted to offer. And we also found that the only opportunity for dedicated funding for transit in our state is a quarter cent sales tax. So we're very limited in um, 
our approach to uh, dedicated funding. And uh, so we started down that path. And in our area, um, we, we needed, because of the level of funding that we required, we needed a, a countywide sales tax. And so in order to get on the ballot, you have to go through the county quorum court. Um, these are the a court of justices of the peace. Uh, I think there's 15 of them in our county. Um, and then there's a, a county judge that is the really the, the county administrator, the mayor of the county, so to speak. And so uh, we didn't realize it, but this ended up being more of a fight than we, than we thought. Uh, it took us quite some time uh, to go through the process and actually get on the ballot. Um, we, we weren't approved for the March 1st ballot until December 15th, uh, which meant we really only had January, February to mount a campaign just because of the holidays. Um, there's nothing being accomplished during, during the holiday time other than, you know, um, you know, behind the scenes type work. And so, unfortunately, it became a partisan issue uh, from day one. Um, the, uh, the quorum court voted to put us on the ballot. It was it split directly down uh, partisan lines. Um, and that's also when Americans for Prosperity entered, uh, entered the scene. Uh, they actually showed up and lobbied um, the folks who, uh, you know, their supporters on the quorum court to, um, to try to, to push you know, push us away, put, get, keep, uh, keep the voters from having an opportunity to vote on transit. And so we, we found out at that point that they were going to be actively involved. Uh, we also found out during that process that transit, um, because we hadn't been at the forefront, kind of like Morgan said, we're not at the list of everyone, the top of everyone's list of priorities. Uh, we found that we actually came under a, a, a greater level of scrutiny than, than any other initiative um, that had gone before the quorum court or gone before the cities. Um, in recent memory. Um, and so that set the stage for a short and difficult campaign. Um, so really I'm, I'm going to focus mostly on Americans for Prosperity and the role that they played just to, to give everyone a heads up about you know, how, how, what their tactics were in Central Arkansas. But I do, I do want to touch on some of the, the other aspects of, of our campaign. Um, coalition building really started from scratch during our plan development. And that, again, that was a major goal was to have the community come together, develop this plan, and then to champion it. Um, but we started that from scratch. There is no um, long-standing advocacy group. We don't have a, a writer's group or a writer union. Um, and really, transit had been in the background for many, many years. Uh, and so, so we had to start from scratch when it came to developing our coalition. But we did find that uh, the, the groups that you would typically think uh, would support transit did, uh, you know, folks like the Sierra Club, AARP, uh, nonprofits in our area that focused on low income uh, and minority neighborhoods, um, planning organizations. Uh, at the end of the day, we had a few chambers of commerce and labor came on board. Um, but one, one ma major issue we found is that even during the planning process for Move Central Arkansas, we had people engaged, but no one really took it serious, weren't able to really get a foothold or to establish that ground uh, that Morgan talked about un until December 15th. Um, no one really paid attention to what we were doing. I can't say no one. Um, it wasn't, again, at the forefront. It wasn't uh, an active part of the, the community discussions until we were placed on the ballot. And that's when um, people really started to pay attention. And that, it was, so it wasn't until January, February that people actually came out in support. Uh, and my, my thought is it was a bit, it was a bit late for us. Um, and uh, one thing to keep... Uh, that's very important is that uh, in our area, and I think probably across the country right now, there's a very uh, high level of anti-tax um, sentiment. Um, and so one, one reason we, I think we struggled is that not a lot of people or a lot of groups were willing to come out in favor of a sales tax. Um, so I think that, that hindered us getting uh, people um, pushing the message early on. They were just unwilling to um, maybe to expend that, uh, that political capital. So some of the things that we did, I mentioned Move Central Arkansas. We really tried to leverage that planning process um, to help educate the community. Um, but we also did extensive community outreach. And this is really from the agency perspective. Um, we, we presented to, just over the last month, I think 25 different groups. So we went out and, and focused on educating uh, any civic organization or neighborhood group that would listen to us. We went out and we talked about the merits of the plan. And that's, and that's what we had to rely upon. We had this great plan that was well vetted well thought out and um, really could have been very impactful. And so we just took that message, showed them how we were improving the economy, air quality, and all the messages that, that you already know. Um, obviously, we used e-newsletters. Uh, during the planning process, we garnered um, hundreds, uh, maybe close to 1,000 contacts. We were able to, 
to leverage that to get out the message. We updated our website and had a campaign website, um, used some social media. Really, the again, we had a very small campaign, short amount of time, uh, very few resources, and so we um, we relied a lot on just us going out and sort of preaching the message, I guess. But also, we worked uh, hand in hand with uh, our local media. Um, we were able to um, to secure a, an op-ed in our statewide newspaper, um, Arkansas Business, which is really the, the large statewide um, business uh, periodical. Uh, we had an op-ed in there as well, and then we were covered. Uh, we had a front cover in a, in a weekly that's very um, heavily circulated in our area. So we relied a lot on just going out and meeting with people, uh, media relations as well. Part of the campaign, we had a few mail outs. Um, we covered uh, a few radio ads, and then um, again, starting from scratch, uh, as far as the advocacy group is concerned, uh, we, we, we had some good volunteers, but unfortunately we just didn't have enough. Didn't have enough time to really mobilize a group to combat um, what Americans for Prosperity um, decided they were going to do. Um, and so I, I did, again, these aren't well-polished slides, but I just really just want to show you what uh, AFB came out with. Um, they had door hangers um, that they they dispersed mostly uh, outside of the core of our county, so areas that transit doesn't touch as much. You know, maybe the service isn't as, as great, the frequency isn't as great, and people don't really have a connection with our system. Um, they targeted them and talked about the fact that um, you know the impact that sales tax increase is going to have on people, and they and they used a lot of spin. Um, you'll notice on the, the the door hanger on the left or the the front side of it says it'll increase county sales tax by 25 percent. Well, it it's sort of true in that, um, obviously, in, in most areas of the country that have a sales tax, there's multiple layers. You have local, you have state, maybe you have special district sales tax as well. For us, the overall sales tax is around 9%. Um, obviously, a quarter of a percent sales tax increase is not 25%. So they use a lot of spin, um, and I'll get to more of that later. Um, it's spin sometimes, and it's just outright lies at others. Um, and obviously they, they focus a lot on the fact that it's a permanent sales tax because what a lot of institutions do in our area, they'll have sales taxes that sunset in a short amount of time. Um, and so they, they focused on that a lot. Um, they also uh, purchased uh, social media, or they boosted their social media um, stories. And so they, they relied heavily on, um, on Facebook. They also used Twitter uh, quite a bit, but they you know, pushed, me pushed messages. There was a guy uh, up at one of the a small college, um, really outside of the area that we serve, um, who put together a, a blog post, and so they highlighted that blog post. It really had a lot of stuff that Morgan talked about. You know, you could buy everyone a BMW or subsidize Uber rides and all of this other uh, other stuff. And so um, those were two tactics that they used. Obviously, the door hangers came along with a, a canvassing program that they had. Um, they targeted the anti-tax crowd again. The areas that uh, are less likely to be impacted by transit. They, they benefited from the plan, but um, we had we had less service in these areas, and so they they targeted uh, folks out in the county, and then um, some of the the neighborhoods and and precincts uh, in Southwest Little Rock that uh, are typically anti-tax groups. Um, according to um, according to their press release after uh, after the campaign, they had uh, folks going out and canvassing, and they knocked on five thousand doors. Um, they made uh, 39,000 phone calls, they claim, um, and we did get word from a few folks that they, these were a mix of robocalls and actual live live calls. Um, and really this is where um, even this group uh, sort of um, entered into a gray area with how they were operating. Um, basically, when they were making phone calls, they, uh, they used tactics like, again, they focused on the 25% tax increase. They really tried to spin the numbers uh, to their favor. Um, they actually, in the robocalls, they mentioned that an increase in sales tax would take food out of the mouths of children. Um, and uh, really, but the core of their message was government needs to focus on other priorities. And these were roads, schools, jails. Uh, and the transit really shouldn't be considered. Um, and then they focused on this, what I would call the empty bus myth, that you know, so few people are actually riding the bus. Um, and because our community doesn't have a great understanding of, of what we do and the magnitude magnitude of what we do, uh, these messages could be could be effective at times. So we we did our best to combat what they were doing. Um, some of what we did, I completely agree with what Morgan said, is that you have to have your um, your your message and stick to it. But at times we would add to our message a little bit just because we did get so much media attention. Um, 
uh, television news and that sort of thing, we did make sure that we addressed some of what AFP was saying uh, as far as um, you know, investing in roads and how transit can can uh, uh, have a positive impact on on that asset and that infrastructure. How uh, transit gets people to to educational opportunities, and so investing in schools uh, is a part of what we do. Uh, and then obviously the, the jail aspect is something they focused on a lot, um, talking about the fact that jails increasing jail capacity should be our number one priority as a county. We focus on the fact that transit can keep people out of jail because they're gainfully employed and are able to to get access to opportunities. Um, and we use their channels of communication uh, as best we could. Um, again, a lot of times they'll focus on conservative radio, talk radio, and so we made sure that we had we took the opportunity to to get on a few radio shows to 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 counter what they were saying, just to try to give people a, a balanced perspective of the issue. Um, I showed you they use social media. We would have used it anyways, but we uh, actually boosted um, some some articles and some other things that were transit supportive more than we would have probably. Uh, but knowing that they were, were doing that. Um, but the bottom line for us is that in our area, again, our issue um, received a higher level of scrutiny than most tax initiatives in our area do. And I think it's because there's not a solid base of understanding of all the benefits of transit. So starting from scratch, um, we found that we just need to continue to educate, educate, educate. Because really when you spend five minutes with someone and you educate them on the plan and what we were trying to do, we, we convinced a lot of people. Uh, unfortunately, our campaign was short and didn't have the resources it needed to get out to more people. But I think for, for us, and I think maybe in, in other areas to where a transit isn't at the top of the list of priorities, just helping people better understand um, what we're trying to do, and, you know, the impacts it can have on the community. And a lot of times the agency can do that. Um, it's not necessarily always, you know, an advocacy group, if, if, if there aren't enough people around that can do that or have a speakers bureau, I just think uh, tr agency staff can do a better job of elevating um, the public perception of, of what we do. But like I said in the beginning, I think we developed a strong base of support. Uh, we know who our friends are now. Uh, we know who the, the, the groups and, and the elected officials who are willing to support transit. Uh, they came out. It was, it was too little too late as far as our initiative was concerned. But we, we know where they stand now. And we, we know we'll be more successful uh, when we go back out in the next couple of years. But, um, but thanks for the time. Absolutely. Um, thank you very much. I apologize for mispronouncing your name as I introduced you. Um, no. brain, brain fade on that one, so thank you. Um, and our, our final speaker is uh, here in California with me. Move LA is one of the premier advocacy organizations um, in Los Angeles County and has had tremendous success over the years with um, making sure that public transit is not just at the table, but driving the conversation in terms of um, how we invest in transportation here in Southern California. Um, and we're very fortunate to have with us today Gloria Oland, who's um, the head of communications for Move LA. So Gloria, take it away. Hi, everybody. It's so interesting to hear about how these ballot measures play out in other parts of the country because I feel like it's a very different story here. And um, unfortunately, there's only 10 minutes left, so if I do talk, there's not going to be any time for questions. I don't know, Kristen, Kristen if maybe you can, maybe people yeah, can yeah. put out our so, contact. Sure. So um, if you can go, go just do a cup go through a little bit of your presentation. Um, you know, if you can do it a little expeditedly, that would be great. Um, we may run a couple of minutes over. And if you have to jump off the webinar, please. You know, I totally understand that. We will have the rec recording posted. I would like to get to a couple of questions, so we may run a couple minutes over. But if you have to jump off, you can come back at a later time and watch that on the CFTE website. Okay. So um, this is going to be our fourth half cent sales tax for transportation in LA County, and it is going to be a whopper. It's going to raise $120 billion. It's, but this hasn't, there's a final decision is going to be made in June. So I'm, I'm talking as if it's a done deal, but it's not yet. But I think it, it's almost a done deal. Anyway, it's an augment and extend sales tax measure, which means uh, there's going to be a new 40 year probably sales tax measure. Uh, providing a half cent, and then we are going to extend the Measure R sales tax that we passed in 2008 
probably for another two decades. It will raise the overall tax rate to 9.5%. Polling is strong. Uh, seems like 70% of the voters are with us. But we need 66.76. We need a supermajority, so it's still no sla slam dunk. And there will probably be a lot of measures on the ballot, so will voters make it all the way to the bottom of the ticket and see our measure wherever it is on the ticket? That's uncertain. But it's funny because um, I feel like you're all suffering from anti-tax stuff now, but we're st and we are not. We have no anti-tax critics, but we are still suffering from the anti-tax revolt of 1978, which required a two-thirds vote for all funding measures. So nonetheless, we believe it, it, it's enforced a kind of discipline on us, and this discipline I will provide as advice to advocates in other places. We believe that a sales tax measure, in order to win a two-thirds vote, has to have something for everyone in it. Um, everybody's got to, you know, everybody's also got to compromise, be willing to compromise, like go for what they want, but assume they're only going to get maybe 70% of what they want. Um, it's got to be a very ambitious sales tax measure or you won't get hurt above all the noise in this county. Um, it's got to have transformational potential. So we are in LA building a system, not just a line. You've got to have big, sexy, iconic rail projects in it, like you know, connecting to the airport or going up for the 405, which is our hugely congested main north-south artery, or building a subway to a sea. So anyway, what do we have? Uh, again, Metro's staff proposal is going to come out on Friday, so we don't know. This is our proposal, but quite honestly, we think that this proposal looks a lot like what's going to be in um, Metro's proposal as well. It's basically, you know, 35% for big capital projects, 25% for bus and rail operations, 25% goes back to the cities for local projects, and probably 15% for highways and clean freight. Um, next, Kristen. Um, so, again, I have to say we don't really have any anti-tax people here because everybody is so desperate for some kind of traffic relief. And so that's how we're pitching this measure, um, which is kind of a problem because, you know, there's a lot of talk in California about induced demand and how when you build more road capacity it just fills up with traffic right away. So I don't really know that building all this you know, all these rail lines is going to actually provide traffic relief. But nonetheless, that's what voters want to hear. So that's how we're pitching it. Um, it's through the rail lines. Uh, right now we have 73 miles of rail. Um, after Measure R, the last sales tax, after all those projects are built out, we'll have 176 miles. With this new measure, we'll have 243 miles. So it's going from a hub and spoke system, which with nine lo lines radiating out of downtown, to this much more complex system that allows people to transfer from one rail line to another, or from a rail line to a bus line. Goes from a hub and spoke to a more of like a spider web that captures a lot of more origins and destinations and a lot more riders. And so we think that it's going to be a much, much more effective rail system than the one that we have right now. It will also provide a lot of opportunity for, you know, community transit-oriented development in communities that's walkable and bikeable. I think it will finally break the stranglehold that the car has on our regions, on our region. Okay, next, Kristen. Um, you know, again, we don't have really any critics. There have been some mode wars, a uh, little bus versus rail stuff, because I think a lot of people who are dependent on bus to get to their jobs worry that the rail lines aren't going to take them where they need to go. And Metro is reorganizing its bus system and trying to make it more efficient, putting more buses on lines that have a lot of ridership and taking them off lines that don't. So there's been some friction there, but, um, and the bigger kind of
critical thought is that rail is so freaking expensive, you know, $120 billion. And a lot of people say that, you know, why don't we just focus on shared use mobility and driverless cars and Elon Musk's, you know, underground pneumatic tubes. And this is an old school um, technology and we shouldn't be spending so much money on it. But anyway, even though we don't really have any critics, we this was an article that appeared in the LA Times on the front page above the fold maybe six weeks ago. And it was not a great advertisement for another sales tax because it said, wow, we're spending billions of dollars, but if you look at transit ridership, it's going down. And so uh, everybody was scrambling for a while. There are a lot of, you know, a lot of reasons. The Great Recession, continued high unemployment, cheap gas, system that's still in its infancy, cutbacks in bus transit, the blue line, which is, has the highest ridership, has been undergoing a lot of um, work and has been closed. Not closed, but you have to take a bus from, part, from some stations to other stations. So anyway, also the, the big criticism with this graph is that in 1985, which was peak ridership, well, it was just after the Olympics, which indeed a lot of people were riding transit. And it was also after three years when a previous sales tax measure had subsidized bus fares. So bus fare was only 50 cents for three years. So that was a that was a kind of artificial peak. And indeed, we have gone down. Um, next, Kristen, I guess. And I, I would say also about this is that all kinds of people came out of the woodwork to defend transit. And um, I do, in the end, the LA Times will endorse this matter. LA Times has been very favorable about transit all along. Um, Kristen had also asked how we work with media, but uh, it's 11.59, so I guess we skip that. But let me just say, I, think, I also think that the other key thing in our success here has been that we have built a serious coalition that is pro-transit, and it's a permanent coalition. And every year we get together, and there are 500 or 600 people in the room, including the mayor. And, agency leadership and, and just ordinary people who really care about transit because we're so desperate in this county because of traffic. So um, I, th I think that having a permanent coalition is critical. I don't think you can get a really big coalition up very quick. And we started as a sort of classic green, blue, green, you know, business, labor environmentalist coalition, but now we've expanded it to include faith-based groups and community-based organizations and seniors and students and people with disabilities and it's just, it's it's big. So it's 12 o'clock, or I guess it's 3 o'clock where you are, but it's 12 o'clock here and I guess that's all I'll say. Good luck with well, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Gloria. We really appreciate you. Um, working with the, the time restraints today. We do have a few questions, and we've got about 75 people on the line. So if our panelists are OK to answer, I'm going to um, throw the questions out there, and um, we'll continue. And if folks need to go, um, I'm sure that the answers will be posted on the CFPE uh, website, uh, w along with the slides after uh, the webinar is done. So our, our first question is um, what about internal critics? Critics within the transit community, community but outside your coalition. How do you uh, deal with um, critics from within our own uh, universe? How does that affect your uh, campaign? Anybody uh, care to tackle that one? This is Morgan. I'll, I'll hop on with that one. I think it really comes down to understanding the nature of their criticism. Um, you know, I've seen elections in different parts of the country where folks think that an initiative isn't uh, isn't robust enough, or it doesn't do something that's important to them. And that really comes back to the early uh, planning stages. Uh, as you're as you think you're going to go out 
for some sort of, of referendum or some sort of initiative, understand what your supporters want. Uh, these are folks who should who should be there. At a minimum, you know, you want to understand their issues, and if you can't get them on board, get them to stay home. Uh, at least don't work against you. And I think that's that's probably the simplest thing. Oh, I think I think uh, you're you're right about that, Morgan and um, Gloria. I don't know if you want to address maybe our Measure J campaign in LA and how um, we did have. Uh, some internal transit critics um, that were not on board with that measure and how we dealt with that. I, I guess, Marnie, I would say about Measure J, I just feel that that campaign got started so late. I mean, we didn't even, you know, have the legislation to that made made it possible to put it on the measure or on the ballot until so late. And the mayor, who had been our big champion and who had done so much fundraising, was very involved in the Democratic and Republican national conventions, and um, I that's I kind of blame it on the lateness of the campaign starting up. But I, I would also say that I think it's very important to work with critics. I kind of think you have to compromise, compromise, compromise in order to win, but you have to compromise strategically. And you really, again, I think it goes back to that coalition building. You work with people and work with people and work with business and work with labor. And, you know, you just, you, it just takes a long time and a lot of talking, but you can bring a big coalition into agreement around a common agenda. This is Tom. I would I would totally agree with Gloria, what Gloria said. If you think back to the, I think it was July of 2012, Atlanta vote. I mean, they had the the Tea Party, they had the NAACP and the Sierra Club all against the measure that would have been, as I recall, like a half cent sales tax in a ten county area surrounding Atlanta. But Gloria is absolutely right. You cannot force a measure. You've got to take a year, two years, three years building a consensus and building the coalition. You can't bake this pie too quickly. So that's that's what I would say in dealing with the critics. You gotta you gotta give you gotta allow some time for this to to mature and be ready to go to the voters. Thank you. So um, we have a, another question. Um, could the speakers provide their thoughts on getting local and state political support, for example, uh, local elected officials, state legislators, et cetera? How important is it to your campaign to have champions? And I'll add an addendum to that question. How important is, is it to pick the right champion? Well, this is Tom. Um, I think it's it's critical to have the right champion, and the right champion is someone, in my estimation, who often is not an elected leader, and and it, it's best if it's not somebody from the transit agency, because that looks appears to the public to be self-serving. You know, vote for a tax increase so I can increase my salary. You know that that does not sell well. Uh, we've seen effective champions be uh, heads of educational institutions, um, heads of hospitals. Uh, you know, hospitals rely heavily on public transit to get their workers to and from uh, their jobs. So uh, you've got to do this carefully, and it's best if it's someone who's recognized throughout the community and someone who does not appear to have a vested interest in the outcome of the uh, referendum. Yep. Gloria, and I'll say that, I mean, you definitely need high profile leaders, elected officials. You definitely need somebody, ideally a mayor, who can champion the measure. and. I think the way you bring these people into your campaign is is you do it, I mean, the way we do it is at this big national, or at this big yearly conference that we have, 
we bring a lot of elected officials, mayors and uh, city council people, and we put them up on the stage where they can hear what other people are saying and where they can talk to people about what they care about. And again, I just think it goes back to the importance of a coalition um, and just talking continually among yourselves and meeting continually and working out all the rough spots. And I think we've been helped in all of this because Denny um, Zane, our executive director, was a very high profile mayor in a high profile city, the city of Santa Monica, and he knows how to talk to elected officials, knows how it looks from the inside. So I think that that's helped us a great deal. Yeah, in Central Arkansas, that we ended up garnering support from most of the mayors in our county. Um, the issue we had is that that support came um, really the days before the uh, before the election. Um, and, and I think all that had to do with the anti-tax climate in our area and the apprehension of saying, yes, I support a tax increase. Um, but now um, we know that they are supportive. Um, again, timing will impact things, but um, we'll be continuing to engage them and uh, garner their vocal support, not just their support telling us we're doing a good job, pass on the back, but actually go out um, at city council meetings and, and at the, the different civic organizations that they meet with and are a part of, uh, that they are vocal vocal advocates. Um, that's especially true in our in our county. When, when you get outside of the core cities of Little Rock and North Little Rock, it's, it's uh, much less dense and then um, it gets, you know, it's rural uh, after that. And um, in those areas where we don't have, where transit doesn't have a large presence now, um, we, it's critical that we get mayors on board. Great. So um, we're at about 10 minutes past 12, and um, we do have one more question, and then we'll go ahead and wrap up. Um, and I just want to uh, point everyone to uh, www.cfte.org. Um, that is the, the website that uh, CFTE has set up. Um, copies of the, the slides that are presented today will be available there. Um, lots of great resources for you from the Center for Transportation Excellence. Lots of great resources available on the NAPTA website for advocates um, and grassroots organizations looking to build coalitions. Our last question focuses on how we ensure that the coalition effectively includes business community and faith leaders. Um, and, and how do you uh, decide who participates in the coalition? Um, and so I wanted to uh, throw that out there to the panel. This is our last question for the day. How did you bring everybody to the table and, and how important was that to you in addressing the critics that you, uh, that you had in your community? Well, this is Tom. I would say you never stop building your coalition and that's what Gloria said earlier. And uh, so you, by saying that, I am not sure you ever get everyone to the table. But I think it's important that, that you um, recruit some key people early. And um, I would list, the, put at the top of that list is minority populations, minority pastors, um, Latinos, others, and the reason is is that you need you need the those those people will vote for taxes, and you need them to be in uh, your advocacy early, and you need them to be pushing with you to get this passed. I mean, we I saw a mistake made in a city about uh, eight years ago, where. You know, it got to be three weeks prior to the election, and, and somebody said, well, we ought to call up the African-American ministers and see if they'll be with us. Well, they were offended that everything had been decided before they were included. And thus, the African-American, which should have been overwhelmingly in favor of this particular measure, um, you know, barely passed it. Um, so it's, you know, get out there early. Start talking to people early, not a month prior to the vote day, but a year and 18 months prior to the vote day. 
I'll add that I think faith-based groups are so important to bring into the coalition also because they um, can turn out a constituency to vote. And I think it's important to be able to, it's important to have groups in your coalition that have constituencies like seniors or people with disabilities. You know, they usually have big constituencies that they communicate with regularly and they can turn out these constituencies for a vote. But again, I, I just think it all goes back to this whole thing about coalition building, start meeting early, keep on meeting, keep talking, 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 avoid divisive issues. There have been some particular issues here. There's a big freeway out of the port. Uh, the measures have put money into that freeway and people want that to stop. So we kind of just don't go there. We try to stay focused on the big picture and on the bigger goals and not get involved in, in more local issues or, or in such a way that is as, as undivisive as possible. Great. Well, I'd like to thank our panelists today. Uh, this was a great webinar. Uh, Jared Barner, Gloria Owen, Morgan Lyons, Tom Shrout. I mean, some of the, the best experts in the country on this particular topic. Um, we have our next stop on the Six Stops to Success on Tuesday, May 10th at 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time, partnering with local officials. So I think that last question uh, or two was a nice segue into our upcoming topic. Um, July 12th, 2016, we'll also be having a webinar on data polling and campaign intelligence. And in the September-October time frame, our final webinar, our sixth stop on success, to success, uh, will be uh, announced later. And check back at cfte.org forward slash six dash stop in the coming weeks for confirmations. I'd like to invite all of you to attend the uh, NAFTA uh, Advocacy Day in Washington, D.C. as part of the APTA Legislative Conference next Tuesday, we'll have um, advocates from across the country um, learning some great um, uh, tools to be more effective on the Hill and talking with legislators um, and getting an update from APTA on tools that they're making available to grassroots organizations for their use um, in getting the transit vote educated and engaged. Thank you again, and we are out for today. <laughs>